Welcome back to another Chat with the Archaeologist, presented by the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project. We're going to begin with some announcements, and then we'll go into our interview with the guest archaeologist for this month, Dr. David Witt. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different of a format rather than a mini lecture. This is going to be more of an interview format, uh, but otherwise much the same as you all have come to expect. Then we'll follow up with some archaeology in the news stories. I think some of you out there, many of you out there, might actually be excited for our first uh, headline story, which will be on the footprints from the White Sands uh, National Monument uh, here in New Mexico. So uh, that's going to be really uh, uh, an exciting topic to cover. I do want to, of course, take some time for uh, some announcements. We are, uh, for one, still doing private tours. As I've uh, gone back and forth on the air over the last few months, we've uh, been on the fence about whether to do public tours or just private tours. We have decided to just fill out the rest of this tour season just doing private group tours. That said, um, anyone is still welcome to do this. You'll just have to uh, book your tour as a private tour rather than doing this in a mixed group. And we will still be welcoming guests for tours onto the preserve, at least into the start of November, uh, or so we anticipate. That said, uh, we do have a limited number of docents, so the uh, tours availability is somewhat limited and uh, fills up pretty quickly. So don't put off your reservations until the last minute. Definitely uh, do call us reserve through the online system. I believe the online system is up and running right now. Uh, make your reservations, plan in advance, plan at least a week in advance. I'd suggest two weeks in advance because as I said, those dates are filling up. Also, we want to uh, extend our gratitude to uh, Tosh Deans um, along with our, our many donors, but in particular this week we would like to thank Tosh uh, Tosh Deans for your very generous support. Uh, there's a lot more that goes on here at the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project than just these streams. Uh, these are just kind of a, a glimpse, but off camera we do a lot of community outreach work. We have, as many of you know, a grade school curriculum that gets shared with local schools and that's actually happening this year. So. Uh, when you donate to the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project, know that you're also supporting things like youth education along with this public outreach programming, research, and the, uh, of course the recording and preservation of the petroglyphs and other archaeological materials on the Mesa. Uh, next, we've got at the end of the month, I don't have, I don't have it avail the, the guest available um, right now on my screen, but we will have another Mesa Talk the last Wednesday of the month per usual, so uh, stay tuned, um, follow us on social media and, and you'll see the link for that. Thank you to everyone who joined us for the last Mesa Talk with, uh, with Sev Fowles, who does his research in the Dixon area as well as along the Rio Grande Gorge. So, Sev is uh, a, a known member of the community here. Uh, well, we welcome him every time he comes out for research. And so, thank you to Sev for coming on, delivering a wonderful talk. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Sev's talk. You can catch the replay of Sev's talk uh, right now on, on Facebook. We will be uploading it to this YouTube channel, as well as Amanda Samanko's talk from the month prior. And Amanda's talk was also amazing. So, also check that one out. Uh, as I said, you can, you can find that. You can find the links on our Facebook page and also on our website. Thank you, everyone, for uh, supporting Mesa Talks, and we do hope to start bringing these to you in person next year. Chat with the Archaeologist, though, will remain a webcast, and we've got new things in the works, but I'll wait to announce those until we get a little bit closer. So without any further ado, let's dig in. All right, 
so I'm joined here by uh, Dr. David Witt, uh, who's, David, I know you're busy, so uh, thank you for taking the time to join us, and uh, uh, I, I hope things stay calm enough for you to uh, be able to stay on. Uh, so again, very much appreciate you making the time. Uh, David, do you want to start telling us with, uh, where did you do your undergrad? <laughs> uh, so I went to Baylor University in lovely Waco, Texas. Um, I, there's a bit of a long history regarding um, the reason why I chose there, but it basically boils down to I wanted to go to a private school uh, that had a program in archaeology, specifically not anthropology. And I ideally wanted it west of the Mississippi because at the time I was living in LA, that's where I grew up. And I uh, found out there were two. Uh, so it was Baylor or Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, Washington. And while I've heard great things about Pacific Lutheran, uh, it was a school of about 3,000. So I decided to go with something that was larger than my high school. Um, so that's why I chose Baylor. Well, that's um, actually very interesting that you mentioned you were looking for an archaeology program not a broader anthropology program. What were some of your uh, motives for that? And would you mind explaining to the audience, some of whom are not necessarily archeologists, what the difference is and, and why we tend to pair these together, at least here in the US? Uh, so I wanted to pretend that I was a scientist, uh, not just a theorist. Um, in the US and in Canada, uh, archaeology is often grouped, usually almost always grouped with anthropology. It's viewed as an anthropological science. Uh, we interpret the archaeological evidence that we find through anthropological lenses. And it's a very important way of you know, diving into the patterns that we recover from the site while also uh, um, tying it in with a greater human experience. But I particularly wanted to learn more about the scientific techniques of doing so, the geoarchaeology, the lab science, uh, the, um, you know, analyzing lithics, and so on like that. Yeah, and we're in kind of a, a strange position, kind of straddling uh, two worlds. We've got, of course, the, the hard sciences methods um, that are also going to be a part of the news stories that we're going to cover, but we also... We borrow a lot from sociocultural anthropology and from the humanities. It's kind of a, a, a weird thing, a, a weird line to walk sometimes. Um, all right, so we covered undergrad. How about uh, field school, the, uh, the rite of passage for every archaeologist? The field school? Uh, my first field school was in Urukpu, and I'm probably butchering that pronunciation, but Urukpu and northwestern Denmark. Uh, we were actually trying to, uh, we were doing a landscape um, uh, study of uh, the utilization of the wider landscape from, I believe it was Middle Bronze Age all the way up through post Roman Iron Age. And uh, we were using phosphate analysis sampling to determine, to try to find those hot spots of human occupation over time, which if you aren't aware of phosphate analysis, is a fabulous tool for doing those large scale questions. Um, it worked out really well. Unfortunately, they found the trading post uh, the year after I did my field school. So I did a lot of walking through cow patties, but not much digging which is fine. Uh, I had a fun time and it was a really good experience and that was through Baylor. Um, but I've also been involved with a program out well out there in New Mexico, the Toda Archaeological Program, which is put on by Linda Wheelbarger at the San Juan College up in Farmington. And I've been there many, many years at this point. Um, well, maybe not many, many. But I've been there for several years, uh, on and off. I did my dissertation research there, as well as some follow-up research. And I was there last summer and hope to be back this summer with some fun new toys that I won grants for. And, you know, before we get into your dissertation research, which is uh, really fascinating, um, I wanted to ask about where you went to grad school. Um, but. Of course, I want to also make a, a comment here of uh, the diverse experiences that you had in field school. 
now kind of help me understand how you've been able to revi uh, um, write on uh, diverse cultural areas in some of your publications. Uh, particularly, I'm thinking uh, your work with Christy Premieu in 2018, which we'll get to in a minute as well. Um, oh, yeah. But, I, oh. Oh. So my, with undergrad, my focus, my, my other degree wasn't just archaeology. I actually had a dual major with uh, history. And so I had, a, um, you know, I took, uh, I was one class short of a minor in Latin. I did a lot of stuff related to uh, European history from, um, you know, pre-Roman Iron Age through uh, high Middle Ages. And that's really what my focus was going to be. I went to State University of New York at Buffalo for a grad school. And they have a really good program that focuses on the archaeology of Europe, of Europe and the Mediterranean, um, particularly those um, classical areas as well as the the you know Celtic lands and Scandinavia and England and so on. Um, it, it's uh, I unfortunately was in a situation where my plan for field school, which I was supposed to be doing my research actually in Italy, in Metaponto, looking at the concepts of creolization and the political hegemony and the relationship that communities have with a uh, political organization, in this case Rome, uh, coming and expanding into these Greek colonies in the south of Italy. Um, but unfortunately, things just didn't work out, and I was left uh, literally Googling for field schools in North America, trying to find a place where I could take all the theory and methodology and all these you know, high-level concepts I've learned through grad school and apply it to some place within the United States that I could drive to um, and uh, get some quick research in so I could continue along with that process of uh, proposing dissertation research, um, taking my advanced exams and all that fun stuff. I'm having uh, just a few technical difficulties on my end, uh, but nothing, nothing too major here. Um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll be able to limp the string stream along with, even with a, a couple of things malfunctioning. Um, so yeah, I, I can, I can feel you on that sort of crisis. I very much changed course in, in grad school. And I, I think we, uh, we had actually been, uh, talking online around the time that I was going through this sort of crisis of what am I going to do for my dissertation? This initial project is falling through. I, th I think you actually like, uh, got to hear some of that as, as it went down from me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, definitely, um, things take a... You're not a grad student unless you have a crisis or three. So. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you, um, you left off, I think you were, um, you were looking for field schools in North America, and that, that's how you end up coming to the Southwest. So is that, um, tell us about your dissertation research, and is that a part of what led you into studying what you did for your dissertation? Um, well, like I said, I was always looking into these high-level concepts of political hegemony and uh, what happens when one community tries to exert control over others and how those communities, you know, uh, relate to that control, whether or not they fight that control or if they uh, just give up, which doesn't happen, or if they somehow look at what's going on and try to co-opt that for their own purposes, which is usually what does happen. Um, so looking at the field schools that were available and the fact that Southwestern archaeology was one of my first loves in archaeology, the other being Maya um, culture, it, it just fit. And I'm like, you know what? I've always been interested in Chaco and the relationship that it had with other uh, surrounding peoples. And I think that, you know, that it worked out. It worked really well. For my dissertation, I ended up looking at 13 sites uh, throughout the Middle San Juan region or the Tota, which is uh, it's also called. Um, so particularly the San Juan River, the Animus and the La Plata. Um, and I looked at how these communities and sometimes it was very specific 
parts of a community, like a field house, or it was a, a great house, or, you know, sometimes I looked at the larger structure as a well. whole. I looked at how these communities utilized uh, lithic tools as um, it, through a lens of what's called community of practice. So um, how people conceptualized stone tools, which tools, which materials they thought were the correct or the proper or the right tool or uh, material to use for protective tools. Um, and I tied that in with uh, conceptions of uh, identity and whether or not groups were trying to emulate or if they were trading and so on. This is really based on the work that Paul Reed and uh, Lauren Stevens and so on were all doing at uh, at Solomon Pueblo at that time, as well as at uh, Aztec Ruins. But, um, you know, I, I pulled in that material. I noticed I've been saying um a lot, so excuse me for that. That's a tick of mine. Um, there we go. So I looked at Point Pueblo at some other neighboring sites on the Box, uh, Box Square Ranch, um, uh, including, or the Box B Ranch. Um, including Point, Mine Canyon, Tommy, uh, um, Sterling. There's, uh, I looked at the reports and some material from Morris 39, Morris 41, the Holmes Group, some of the cultural resource reports that were done along the La Plata Highway. And then I analyzed materials from Solomon and Aztec, uh, Aztec North and West specifically. Um, and I found that a lot of these communities ended up, some of the ones were not a surprise. Some came up were, you know, indications that there were colonial communities from people uh, coming in from Jocko. Uh, Solomon was like that. Um, uh, uh, Sterling was like that. But a lot of the other communities showed some type of really idios idiosyncratic way of relating to Chaco. Some of them I, I interpreted to be more of like a trading post where local people were supplying goods to Chaco, whereas other communities like Aztec were this odd mixture of the local individuals, communities doing their thing, and then working and uh, creating this weird um, mixture of Chaco and local culture. Uh, Point Pueblo was a very similar one that as we keep doing more work there, uh, we get more and more evidence that was a very, you know, important site early on. And we're talking now, like, um, there's evidence of basket maker three there, and that it was occupied all through up to Pueblo three. Um, and uh, they had an early great Kiva there uh, that was remodified a couple of times. They had a very large great house. Uh, we're talking maybe three stories. Um, 50, 60 rooms. Uh, it's D-shaped. There's an arc of rooms in the front with a plaza. There's another plaza kiva uh, um, based on surface depression, let me put it that way. And then there's a uh, blocked-in kiva within the room block that has uh, paint that's very um, uh, reminiscent of some of the other kivas that we see in the area. So, um, you know, the more we find out about point, the, the cooler it becomes. Uh, a lot to jump off on there. Uh, what Paul Reeve was, uh, Paul Reeve was one of our guests in, I believe, June. Um, so uh, awesome that you mentioned Paul Reeve's work as, as an inspiration. And um, uh, Aztec, we've had some folks who have connections to uh, work done at Aztec on here, but I actually wanted to uh, ask you to, to clarify for, for the audience, uh, Basket Maker, Basket Maker Three, Pueblo One through Three. What are some of the uh, the broad trends that distinguish Basket Maker and Pueblo, and and why is going from Basket Maker Three to Pueblo Three so significant? Oh, oh! Now you're asking me to remember stuff from undergrad. Um, <laughs> uh, basically, uh, for those people that aren't aware, I'm using terminology from the Pecos chronology. Uh, it's basically is a way of describing broad cultural trends uh, 
basket maker three. We, we use a slightly different chronology here in the northern Rio Grande, although some folks use your chronology. Um, so it gets a little confusing, but go ahead, continue. Well, basket maker that's three. the Pecos chronology is the best one. Um, <laughs> so uh, basket maker three, if I'm remembering cor correctly, is AD 500 to about 750. Pueblo one is 750 to 950. Pueblo two, which is usually seen as like the height of Chaco civilization is, or Pueblo civilization, is from 950 to 1100, 1120, 1140, 1150, depending where you're looking. And then Pueblo three is 1150 to 1350. Um, so what we have is really, uh, at least at the point site, we have evidence of occupation going from I remember correctly, it was 700 or so, so late back in Maker 3, all the way up through the beginning of the 14th century. And uh, during this time, there was a lot of social upheaval in the Southwest. So, so to have these sites that continue to persist throughout that is pretty remarkable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Steve Lexon described the... Um, population in the San Juan Basin as like water in a bathtub that sloshes from one end to the other. Um, and to have a population center, a pretty sizable one, that just maintains continuity through that and is a center for its community um, is really, really interesting. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so uh, Chaco, Chaco outliers now. Um, let's, because we just had Michelle Turner on, on the stream last month, and then I think uh, actually last night she just gave a talk through the uh, Crow Canyon Archaeological Center on some uh, recent work done at Chaco outliers. So uh, what are Chaco outliers and um, why are they significant? How do they relate to this sort of like sloshing bathtub motion in the uh, San Juan and, and, and surrounding area? So I um, I tend to agree more with Steve Weston than I do with some other archaeologists on what Chaco outliers are. I do think that Chaco outliers are um, control centers uh, in a way. Um, they're hegemonic uh, locations where Chaco and influence uh, was instituted or was invited or whatever, and then was in place through its local community. Um, sometimes these were locations of gathering of specific uh, materials that were then used and transported to Chaco. Sometimes these were ritual locations or um, spiritually sacred important locations that were used. I, I do think that more than a few of them were just locations used to manage and maintain control over the extent of the San Juan Basin. Um, you know, Chimney Rock is a good example of that, as well as it being, um, you know, ideally located to look at a, a sacred geological aspect, which is the, the Chimney Rock and uh, Twin Spire or whatever it is. Um, and there are other ones. Um, all along the rim of the San Juan Basin that has this kind of weird association or cool association with twin rock features. But I do think there's a good portion of them that were legitimately just put there as, you know, this is our way of maintaining control over this territory. Um, some could be way stations along Chalkburn Roads, and we could have a discussion as to what Chalkburn Roads were. Um, but I, I do think that uh, the way I interpret these chocolate outliers is not that they were just community centers, which they were. Uh, some of them were a result of the actions of the community, and some of them were the result of the actions of chocolate leaders. But they were really the manifestation of chocolate control through the area. And so uh, that kind of gets back into those. Uh, more theory heavy concepts that you mentioned at the very start, right? That really is what drew you into archeology span and, and in particular the archeology span of this area, right? Like the, the political economy of that. Um, so with Chaco, we, we say great houses for, uh, for these constructions. And 
here in the northern Rio Grande, some of the pueblos can be pretty big, over a thousand rooms. So why don't we say, why don't we say great houses after Chaco? Why don't we say great house here? So um, the standard definition, I think, would be because uh, you see the, I don't want to say downfall, I don't like the idea of collapse, but you see a uh, um, marked decrease in this hegemonic influence starting at about 1150 and then continuing through the 13th century and so on. And so once you get to what we would call the Pueblo IV period, uh, which is this period of migration and reorganization and relocation from the San Juan Basin and the surrounding highlands over to the Rio Grande area. Um, people have a different relationship with communities and with uh, leadership than they did before. Um, and a lot of the time, the uh, individuals say that what we see in the Pueblo IV period or uh, what we see there in the Rio Grande area is a more hierarchical or egalitarian expression of Pueblo life, uh, which in itself would be a very distinct reaction to and rejection of what was going on at Chaco. Uh, I, I do tend to agree with that, but I also think that we tend to look at what was going on in the Pueblo past through rose-colored glasses and try to fit the uh, anthropological discourses and the ethnographies and so on of the you know 1800s and the 1900s um, and try to make those fit into what we see in the archaeological record and I don't think that's a particularly uh, helpful way of investigating the archaeology. Um, what uh, I do think is that we really need to take a look at what had gone on at Chaco that led up to that migration and really look and interpret the, the results of our excavations and our studies and everything of the 13th and 14th and 15th century uh, based on what we know of what came before, not what we know what came afterwards. Um, and I'm definitely not the only one or first one to say that. I, I'm really borrowing a lot of thinking from other people, uh, including Steve Lexon. So, um, it's, you know, uh, read his books. Um, <laughs> I have one coming out at some point, at some point in the future, but, you know, it, Steve's really done a lot of great work kind of diving into the relationship of, of anthropological theory and the interpretation of the archaeological record. And uh, speaking of the interpretation of the archaeological record, research done at Chaco, uh, you've done some very interesting collaborative work with uh, Christy Premu, and uh, so would you like to talk about what you guys did at Chaco, and then, and then uh, how you applied those techniques elsewhere? Yeah, so um, as a bit of a background, Christy and I actually are both employees of New York State's Department of Environmental Conservation, and we worked in the same region um, as permanent animals. And this is kind of where we met. And it was just by coincidence that we were both archaeologists. Um, I was looking at trying to analyze uh, the spread of sound uh, and the impact of sound within this permitting process. And um, again, not at all unique or, um, you know, <laughs> by no means the first person to look at something like that. But I was able to cobble together a spreadsheet to help do the math more quickly and more easily and help verify numbers and whatnot. I went to Christy, who is a god among mortals when it comes to GIS work, and said, hey, can we do this in GIS? And she's like, yeah, we definitely can. So we started doing this collaboration and ended up uh, publishing a paper in the Journal of Archaeological Science Reports a few years ago, uh, exploring um, you know, the tool that mostly she created. Um, and how it can be used to explore these archaeological and anthropological questions. Uh, specific to Chaco, what we had looked at was it, if we interpret the uh, landscape and particular features of the landscape, the mounds in front of Pueblo Bonito and other locations, as 
uh, ideal locations for addressing crowds, for uh, hosting ceremonies, and so on, then um, what would that look like through a soundscape analysis of a landscape scale acoustics analysis, in other words? And we did the modeling that we were able to do with GIS, and it ended up showing the uh, soundscape, um, the extent of where someone could hear someone speaking in a loud, like oratorial voice on those mounds um, were marked by shrines and archaeological sites and corridors and whatnot around the canyon, um, which just was a fantastic uh, coincidence. I, I, I don't believe uh, it's um, what's the quote from Star Trek? Uh, I I believe in coincidences. Coincidences happen every day, but I don't trust them. And so when there was this circumstantial evidence of there being shrines located on the very point where this modeling would indicate that you would take one step forward and be able to hear something um, and be able to see something at the same time, like you would just press the reg and you would see what was going on. It would just open up to you. That really started um, opening up our minds to the uh, possibility that these mounds were more than just trash mounds and heaps and middens, but that they were really used for cultural purposes. And it's not that they might have just not started as mounds or you know middens, but that whatever the purpose for them starting there, they were recognized to be ideal locations for this uh, public presentations. Uh, I interpret it through um, uh, the concepts of political theater and phenomenology and uh, practice and, um, you know, using it, um, drawing in information from the excavations that were done recently by, uh, and I don't have a book here, um, but the Chaco Mounds Project uh, that you know, there's, there's a lot of evidence that these were created by people coming in from outside and that there were ritual depositions. Um, primarily, I, I use the line of uh, reasoning that people were coming in and depositing Narbona past church. Uh, you know, primarily, that's my thought as a lithicist. Um, and that this is this chart, which was not used, but in enough quantity and size that it could have been useful. Um, it was just deposited for various things. There is a lot of, uh, of feasting remains uh, as how I'd interpret it, deposited there. So the way I'm looking at these mounds is that they were actually constructed by the very people um, coming in who would then be the audience of this political performance that would take place on the mounds um, later on as the mounds reached their fullest extent after about 60 years. So. I find that to be really interesting and incredible to think about the nexus between, um, you know, elite control of ceremony and ritual and public theater uh, with how the community itself was an integral aspect of how this control was exercised so, or the theater was exercised. And that makes me wish that we had uh, digital elevation models for uh, places like St. Louis uh, or um, the Eastern Bay Area, uh, the, the East Bay Area in, um, you know, Oakland, Berkeley, from before all that development, because we knew that there were extensive pre-contact mounds in these areas. Um, but yeah, that's all, <laughs> that's all for another time. Um, absolutely exciting work uh but i do want to get to our um our headline story in the news because um as someone who does research here in new mexico i figure you probably found this one pretty exciting so uh as many of our audience members probably know by now there is a recent announcement about the dating of some human footprints in former marshland now a dry lake bed in what is now uh, White Sands National Monument. 
And this study has been going underway for a couple of years. Uh, they've been uh, touting their use of 3D modeling uh, very much through a process that uh, many of you are familiar with that, that I use um, and, and that you've seen that some of our other guests have used. Uh, we're doing a process called photogrammetry to get a, a detailed 3D model and they used this to actually uh, document these footprints but it turns out the most exciting part is the dates that came from these footprints. Um, so first off I'm going to bring up, there we go, there's a map. Uh, oh, National Park. I, I keep saying National Monument. It is a national park, um, both under uh, uh, Department of Interior, usually under NPS, although National Monuments can be under BLM. But yeah, White Sands National Park. Um, so here's where it's located. And here's the 3D model. Uh, just one slice of one of their 3D models of some of these footprints. Uh, I don't really have an interactive version on this screen. I'm, I'm sure that their, their data is available somewhere. Um, and, and so this is uh, actually a technique that only a few years ago we really couldn't do. Not, not with this kind of resolution and, and detail. Um, so th this is something that, say, in... Uh, Back in uh, 2009, 2010, when, when I was taking my first archaeology jobs, you would never hear about someone 3D modeling an excavation like this. Um, so that's pretty exciting, but even more exciting. So there, there's some photos of the footprints. We'll, um, some of these footprints may be as old as 21,000 or even 23,000 years old. And that has pretty huge implications. Now, of course, there have been reports of archaeological sites of that age or older in North America and in South America. However, these studies are always fraught with some, some difficulties. And you know, I was just thinking of a cave study uh, last year in Mexico that actually has um, some some problems that they didn't address with their with their dating potential carbon reservoirs from hard water that this study does address and that's what makes this so exciting because they are so thorough that the, the, this really substantiates a human presence thousands of years before most of the evidence that we have um so david do you want to uh pick up from there any any comments on this story Oh God, uh, I was um, flabbergasted when I saw this uh, announced. This is fantastic. Um, I I like to think that maybe we'll finally be listening to our native colleagues when they say that you know people are here before twelve thousand or thirteen thousand years ago. I know what per, uh, Paulette Stevens is probably um, running around telling people, "I told you, I told you." Um, so. I, I think this is great. I do know that there are some critiques or concerns regarding the dating, but uh, without having read into those, I don't really know how strong that is. I do think that this is definitely the strongest site that we've uh, seen from the United States in quite a long time. That said, there's also the Galt site down in Texas that had some very early dates that they keep going back to and keep getting more and more evidence for, and it seems like that's also a very strong, very early date. Uh, Middle Crop Rock Shelter has some early dates. So it's, I, I do think that we will continue to see more evidence just continuing to pile up that there was a, a native uh, presence here long before, uh, you know, 12,000 years ago. Um, it, is, it is just, inevitable, I think, so. And one of the things that uh, kind of surprises me is that a part of the conversation keeps coming back to this uh, Clovis first hypothesis, which uh, was popular in like the 90s. And that was the idea that uh, these, and, and I was just looking for, uh, we've got some fluted points in the office somewhere. <laughs> uh, we, we need an intern to, to catalog our artifacts, seriously. Um, uh, if you're interested in doing archaeological research, we can accommodate you. Um, 
but the uh, the point is is that this is a very distinctive technology, and and this theory was that the Clovis people came into North America probably through an ice-free corridor. We now know that, of course, that's not the case. Clovis actually starts in what's now Mexico and spreads northwards. So it's very clear that there were people here before Clovis. Additionally, contemporary with Clovis, that always gets left out of these Paleo-Indian discussions, is uh, there was an entirely different culture in uh, what's now the Mojave Desert and the western end of the Sonoran Desert. Um, and they they had a completely different toolkit. And um, tradition, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. There's a lot of names for it, like the the Mojave tradition, the uh, San Diego tra uh, tradition. Um, and 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 so it it surprises me that we keep coming back to Clovis. We forget that there's already cultural diversity in the Americas, um, but it, it is. Uh, it, this is also an interesting study because uh, this is before the dates that are uh, believed to be most likely for a uh, Pacific coast route, um, possibly even even using canoes to hop along the coastline. That's not to say that that migration didn't happen, but that that might not have been the first wave. What seems to be really significant about these dates in particular and uh, I just happen to know this because of some uh, extracurricular research I've been doing on um, on uh, the the British Isles, and then and then later on uh, when we get to the Bronze Age, the emergence of the Celtic peoples. But um, but uh, some of the earliest human populations in there, and why they were there at the times that they were, uh, has to do with the uh, the periodic advancing and retreating of the glaciers. So I just happen to know off the top of my head that um, if we were to go with some of the older dates that are suggested at other sites, like 30,000 years ago, ocean levels were actually more comparable to today than they were during, um, during the, the last uh, glacial maximum. But during the last glacial maximum, uh, which was, uh, what is that, uh, 17 to 26,000 years ago, um, just off the top of my head, <laughs> uh, there. then sea levels would be much lower. And so that has a lot of implications. We know um, conservatively by 25, 26,000 years ago, people are hanging out in, and I forget the name of the region in Russia, because it's not Kamchatka, it's above Kamchatka. Um, it's not Siberia, because it's, it's too far east. But uh, what, what we call Beringia, which is, it's the, the very far eastern end of, well, to the audience, the very far eastern end of Russia and the very far western part of Alaska and all the slow-lying land that would have been marshland, wetland, that would have been very productive during a, a glacial maximum because the sea levels were so low. So we know that they were there um, conservatively by then. So these footprints would... Um, they would uh, seem to indicate that, you know, maybe people are, 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 are taking a route along these low-lying, now submerged coastlines. Um, yeah, yeah, and like you said, there, there are some questions about the, the dates. They, um, they didn't make any corrections for uh, a, a carbon sink. So for folks here in New Mexico, many of you have hard water. Hard water contains carbonates that uh, is really old carbon from the rocks that gets dissolved into the groundwater. And so this can skew our carbon dates. That said, they looked into it and decided that they did not need to correct their dates based on other studies. And I just haven't reviewed the, these other studies to see like how thorough those are. Um, yeah, they said like the, the offset would be somewhere around the range of 50 years. And that's just minuscule in comparison to the timescales that they're talking about in this paper. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the, their dates are, are really tight. I mean, when we're talking about, you know, plus or minus 150 years for over 22,000 years ago, that's a really incredibly tight date range. Uh, another reason why I like this article is because of their graphics. Um, they, they, they kept it short and sweet, although 
uh, like we were talking about before we went on air, they did provide plenty of supporting documentation as well. But the, uh, uh, the heart of the article is a short four pages, and their images are all um, both visually appealing, but also easy to understand, except for the, the last figure, um, which uh, is, is a little bit heady because you have overlapping uh, probability ranges for carbon dates, <laughs> and you kind of have to train your <laughs> eye. But um, just this diagram that I'm showing on, on screen uh, shows very clearly how they went down through these layers. And what they do, they go down to a layer where there's human and or animal tracks. They, they, they clear it to that surface, do a 3, 3D model of that, before proceeding excavating through that to the next layer. And that's a part of what I was saying, like, this wasn't possible 10 years ago. Um, and, and, and don't tell me laser scanning, because it doesn't have that resolution usually. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was just mad impressed by, um, you know, one, that they're, they're taking advantage of the tools that we have now, and two, nice graphics, I mean. You can see which levels are associated with human tracks and with how many people and their their size and what kind of animals, if any. And uh, yeah, that 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 was um, uh, a nice surprise. Dealing with a lot of scientific articles tend to uh, assume that you understand what type of chart that they are using, uh, which can be a little disorienting for uh, avocationals. Or even those of us who are professionals, but with a different uh, research focus. All right. So, uh, David, I've got a joke for you. Okay. All right. Why are Near Eastern archaeologists uh, so bad at poker? Oh, God. Thank oh, you. this is bad. They've all got to tell. Yeah. Ha, ha. Um. Speaking of articles with bad graphics, <laughs> the, there's been a, uh, a recent, uh, can we call it a scandal uh, or, or just a fierce debate about uh, a, a recent article about uh, this archaeological site called Tel, uh, Tel El Hamand or Tal El Hamand, um, which I'm assuming is just different dialects. And uh, so this is a, a Bronze Age site in the Near East, in what is now, I believe, Jordan, along the, uh, uh, along the rift zone right there. And the article implies that not only was this city catastrophically destroyed by an airburst like uh, happened in Tunguska at the start of the 20th century, but that that event was the inspiration for the biblical story of Sodom. Uh, yeah, I, they don't just apply it, they outright state it. And I, in uh, just full disclosure, um, the, the other reason why I chose Baylor was because at the time when I grew up, I was raised in a very conservative Christian household. And so I very much come from this mindset that um, relate towards the use of archaeology as a way to prove the Bible right quote unquote. So we can talk about that. Uh, I have a lot of experience with that type of thing. Um, but yeah, just their article, I, I, I looked into it and I read a lot of the critique and that there's, there's some fun issues going on uh, aside from the apparent doctoring of photographs. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's where it starts to go from uh, because I almost, with, with some of these things, want to think, okay, they're just kind of playing fast and loose. Maybe there's just some confirmation bias going on. But then when you start to get the, to the uh, doctoring of the photographs, um, and uh, sorry to the audience, I'm not going to show you because some of these do involve human remains. Um, but, yeah, that, that starts to look a little bit more suspicious. And, uh, you know, we could... Yeah. We yeah, could they, also they, uh, talk they, about their credentials are, are kind of questionable, too. <laughs> yeah, they, it's just, there's, there's enough uh, a cool archaeology from that area that they don't need to doctor fake, uh, fake evidence. 
it really is not necessary especially the evidence like the photos that they were talking about there's no need they it, it, one of the pictures they ended up like photoshopping uh, a tape measure out of you know the vertical extent to show the depth of the excavation some other areas uh, they they had a cage or a sampling device to take soil samples out of the profile and they photoshopped that out of the image for some reason which you know all they had to do is put a a note in there and the image um, description of that's what that is and it would have been fine. There's no reason to um, you know, remove that type or doctor that type of, um, you know, tool. Uh, that's all it is, it's a tool. And I don't know why the hell they thought it was necessary to clean that out. But. It's, it's certainly suspicious, but um, uh, perhaps more problematic is some of the evidence that they uh, purport about uh, evidence of fire, evidence yeah. of uh, the uh, scattering, or, or, or at least um, of disarticulated, unburied human remains, and of um, uh, shocked quartz. Uh, I think shocked quartz would be a good thing to kind of start on. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with geology, um, I, I don't think David or I are, either of us could consider ourselves experts in that. Um, Not expert, no. <laughs> but uh, shocked quartz is something that happens when quartz is put under extreme compressional stress. And it actually changes the crystal lattice because, so quartz is a very hard, dense mineral. And it creates shear planes, but rather than breaking apart because it's compressed together, those immediately refuse with a kind of tweak in the lattice. And it's, it's very distinctive microscopically. Um, well, for one, the article claims that there was shocked quartz associated with the Tunguska event, which it's a little unclear because they don't really cite who they're, they're, um, who they're referencing with that, but it seems that they're possibly referencing a Tunguska researcher who also looked at shocked quartz in the area associated with a completely different event and also it turned out to not be shocked quartz at all and, and so <laughs> what they're calling shocked quartz is uh, both in the Tunguska case and in the uh, Tel Al Hamand case uh, neither of those are actually shocked quartz but even if it were we are looking at a desert environment and uh, something that like it even kind of was mentioned in um, White sands is an example of what happens in a desert environment. Uh, white sands, you have this gypsum breaking down and creating these dunes from uh, all this, this wind erosion, this aeolian movement. Same thing happens in, in the Near East, is that you have the movement of materials based on wind erosion. So even if you had shocked quartz on, on the surface, it would be very difficult to associate that with an event in that spot. Uh, and to eliminate the possibility of it being associated with, with an event somewhere many miles away. Um, yeah, and they, they even pointed that out as one of the critiques for the use of shocked quartz, quote unquote, um, at Tegusca is just the way that the sampling was done. It was not, uh, at least there's no evidence of it being done in context, you know, taken from profiles and so on. It was this material that was just gathered from the surface and there's, you know, who knows where that ends up coming from. Um, if anyone's worked in the Southwest or if you live in the Southwest, you know that sand gets everywhere. And I just, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, issues with their line of argument right here. Um, I, yeah, I, I really feel like that this is, uh, along the lines of, uh, of uh, preconception bias and trying to uh, fit, you know, I, I, if there's circumstantial evidence for an argument, that's, you know, that's fine. You can cite it. You can use it. I've done that myself. Um, but don't, don't try to hide the fact that it's circumstantial, uh, if it even is true evidence. Just you've got to make that clear and be honest about it and then you have to test that because all it does is it helps strengthen the hypothesis but you still need to test the hypothesis and i'm not sure how they're able to do that in this particular case 
Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Uh, it, they don't really make room for an alternate hypothesis. The, their whole article is structured around the, the, this idea that they're going to confirm this argument. And I think this also uh, this brings up a point of tension, uh, particularly between um, those of us archaeologists who work in the Southwest versus biblical archaeologists, because you know we, we do try, uh, at least here in the Southwest, most of us try to include indigenous voices in our work. And um, so there, there's this counter argument of, well, um, the, the Torah, the Bible, these are historical sources. Uh, they're, they're equivalent to indigenous consultation. That's, that's the counter argument. So uh, how would you respond to that? And um, how would you balance that? And, and then I might jump back on uh, to, to add. But yeah, how would how would you separate those? Uh, between the two, um, I the way I look at it is that when someone got this preconceived um, bias, and uh, bias is not a good or a bad thing. Everyone has bias. That's why I try to really push out there that everyone has a bias. We just have to acknowledge it so that we can, you know, understand around it and how that may affect our interpretation. What's going on with biblical archaeology is that there's a particular bias, a very, um, you know, there's a very specific worldview that they're trying to find evidence for. And you've got to keep that in mind. Um, and as someone who was raised in that type of uh, thinking, um, it's, it, it can be pernicious, to be honest. You spend your time trying to find evidence that, yes, your worldview is correct. Um, and in the case of biblical archaeology, um, either it's being done by a Westerner or Europeanist, and it, it, they don't go and talk to someone who has a different take on the material. Um, you mentioned the Torah as opposed to the Bible. You know, those are, you know, the Bible has the Old Testament. The Torah is the Old Testament. It's just interpreted through a Jewish cultural lens. Um, and it's a, a Jewish archaeologist would probably interpret things vastly differently than someone coming in from a Christian perspective. Um, that said, uh, someone, you know, an Israeli archaeologist, a Jewish archaeologist, probably has their own biases, or probably does have their own biases. And uh, it, they may be looking at it for particular heritage claims and so on, and that we have to also be cautious about that. Um, uh, as I was saying earlier, and this is my particular spiel, um, you know, heritage is one aspect of the discussion. You know, it's just as important as history. History is what happened, when, by whom, and all that. Heritage is how history is played and used for uh, particular purposes. Uh, whether it be political or religious or, you know, cultural. And we have to be cognizant of heritage claims and how they may or may not actually relate to history and archaeology and what we look at. And that's, I think, one of the big distinctions between the way that we do consultation here and um, the way that uh, biblical archaeology tries to use that as a source is that... Um, here, because we have the, the, the settler colonial government, the indigenous voices tend to historically be left out. Um, so it, it's, it functions differently rather than there, there being the, this bias to confirm these stories here. It's really historically been a, a bias towards discounting or ignoring the existence of the, these stories, these histories, this traditional knowledge. And so we're, we, we try to blend that in with our scientific work rather than going in with, with some preconception. And uh, I say we, but the, the, there's also been uh, a, a bit of a, a war within archaeology lately about uh, should, should we not mention names or, or should we mention names? Uh, I leave that up to you. This is your podcast. <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm fine calling folks out here. Uh, we, we've uh, got a, a, a strong tradition of uh, calling out racism on this stream. 
Um, and <laughs> that's kind of the way that I see this. It, it, this case is with uh, Elizabeth Elizabeth Weiss, and uh, she is symptomatic of a uh, broader. I, I would say they're definitely a ma minority of archaeologists, but there's definitely been a lot of folks that I know or or have only one or two degrees of separation from uh, who have been questioning NAGPRA, questioning the application of indigenous knowledge, and uh, questioning the stewardship of uh, human remains. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, wh what do you want to say on that topic? Oh, God. Um, first of all, they're not our ancestors. I'm not indigenous. I, I'm some 100% pure European mutt. Um, and I will fully admit that. So it's not my ancestor, and I feel like the descendant communities should have a say over what's done with their ancestors. There's definitely a part of me as a scientist, that's like, oh, all the things we can learn about that person because of, you know, they left and that, you know, they're there. But it, it, this is where heritage comes in. It's that we really have to um, acknowledge and understand and give priority to the descendant community. Um, the way that I've said it in the past is that if we are truly going to respect the sovereignty of indigenous nations, and that's how I view it, you know, these are sovereignty claims, then we have to be willing to take the step back and say, and we have to take the step back and say, you know what, these are not our ancestors. And I may not like what you do with it, um, I may not like the fact that you may rebury them or whatever, but it's not my role to say anything. It really belongs to the descendant communities. They are their sovereign nations. It's their people that you know. You know, it's their people. And and we have to be very aware of the the political implications because when we when we try to deny that uh, human remains are ancestral to a particular place. And uh, to be fair, not not all uh, not all ancestry claims are substantiated. But uh, in the broader picture, that there, there is real political fallout that can deny deny tribal land claims, deny water rights, deny tribal recognition entirely. And that's yeah. one of the things that uh, indigenous folks have been so upset about with Elizabeth Weiss and others like her is that many of these groups like like the Ohlone which uh, there's there's several different bands of Ohlone that they're not one one individual unit but um ethnolinguistically Ohlone are one of the the peoples of the uh, San Francisco Bay Area and the uh, Santa Cruz area and as someone who uh, who has worked with Ohlone it's um one the fact that they're denied federal recognition makes it a bit harder uh, because we don't have uh, uh, formal channels to go through. Um, but it also makes it easier to ignore them. And they don't really have a legal standing under NAGPRA to have remains repatriated. So then when we get folks like, like Weiss, who's posing on, on Twitter just a couple of days ago with an ancestral Ohlone skull, it's... Yeah, that was just purely offensive. I I mean, she did it for just the shock value, I think. But um, it, yeah, I we could really talk about the, um, the difficulties that nations have when it comes to um, proving their existence. There's particular stories from here in New York. There's, um, I know of others down in Virginia uh, the way I look at it is that this is really going back to political stuff and hegemony. This is really um, settler colonial hegemony uh, forcing uh, indigenous nations to abide by our uh, laws and our way of thinking and our conceptions and our worldviews and all that. And we're not truly giving them the respect that we should as equals. Yeah. And that's that's the really troubling part. Um, I mean, we 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 can go on and on about that, but you know, one we're running short on time, and, and and two, I think I think the audience gets the point that um, you know, 
Weiss doesn't speak for all of us. Springer doesn't speak for all of us. There's a few other names that I could call out too. They don't speak for all of us. Most of us, especially our generation, David, um, most of the folks of our generation are really trying to do right. And, and I have found um, both, both in my own personal interactions with indigenous communities and uh, I've seen in, in other professional studies and work with indigenous communities that, that giving that, that um, um, giving that respect initially, repatriating remains, repatriating grave goods, doing the consultation, um, not excavating a spot when you're asked to, uh, it has, has payoff on the back end that these communities then come to trust you. And then um, some of the, uh, the genetic work that's been done in the last five to 10 years has been in part because remains were repatriated. Um, the, there were studies that were held off. And so the, then the, the, the tribes showed that respect back because, because we showed them, we as the, the archeology span community showed them respect, um, they, they then were more willing to work with us in the long term, And, and, and so I think that that's one of the, the payoffs and one of the things that um, uh, people who oppose NAGPRA are jeopardizing. Um, <laughs> but then we've got, we've got a, a, a lighthearted story, um, uh, which is uh, Neanderthals. And I, I think we'll just, we'll, we'll go out on Neanderthals. So uh, first off, there was um, some recent work on uh, some uh, cave art, uh, really just pigments and ash on uh, speleothems, cave formations in the Iberian Peninsula. But it's pretty significant because it's about 10,000 years before uh, the, the first clear evidence of anatomically modern humans. So this means, well, anatomically modern humans on the Iberian Peninsula. So this means that this was pretty confidently Neanderthal art. And um, David, I, um, when I was an undergrad, is this the same for you? We were told Neanderthals didn't do art, that they didn't have as complex of thinking. Is that the story that you got too? Um, not entirely because of the Shannonar Caves. Um, and I believe that those are Neanderthals. Um, but yeah, for the most part, they were more simplistic and brutish, and they probably stole fire from AMHSS. So. I've, I've definitely stolen fire from a neighbor's campfire before, but <laughs> so it's not limited to Neanderthals. And then, uh, of course, we have this, this uh, other Neanderthal story of the, uh, the facial reconstruction of a Dutch Neanderthal. So this is an application of the use of, well, hominin remains, but well, I'm not showing you the remains, I'm showing the audience the reconstruction. And uh, still has kind of a goofy smile, but he's not quite, he, he doesn't look as um, uh, brutish or unhappy as, as many Neanderthals. He's, he's smiling. And what I think is really beautiful about this one, I'm, I'm gonna full screen him here, um, is, He's asymmetrical. He, he's got a benign facial tumor and it makes his face a little lopsided. So it gives it, his smile this kind of like, you know, dopey appearance. It's a very enduring. Um, like you can almost feel a personal connection with this with this Neanderthal man from uh, what was the date on this? So this has got to be what, roughly 40, 50,000 years ago? Um, I would have to pull the article up to confirm. So. I think that's that's where we'll. <laughs> I'm just gonna I, I'm gonna leave it there. Fade the black. Thank you for joining us, David. Um, if if folks want to learn more about their research, who should they contact? Where should they go? My research. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. My God, I don't think I've ever actually said that before. Uh, follow me on Twitter at I don't dig dinos. That's I D O N T D I G D I N O S. Um, there's stories behind that or you can also find me on academia at uh Sumi? let me pull up that website real fast just to make sure i get the right one uh it's taking forever um i could probably just put it in the there it is buffalo.academia.edu slash david witt uh again that's buffalo.academia.edu slash david witt and I will just throw those in the chat so that people can gather those from there. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to join us.
And uh, oh, yeah, this was great. We're gonna we're gonna leave folks with this uh, this charming Neanderthal. 